and over here. <laughs> All right. Well, um, thank you so much for joining us for ACT's first meeting of 2024. It's also our uh, annual membership meeting where we uh, elect the next slate of officers. Hopefully we get a few more folks in the door for a quorum. And of course, as is our tradition, we tend to go around and introduce ourselves. Um, yeah, uh, please uh, introduce yourself, where you're from, and uh, yeah, your role with ACT. So um, why don't we start over here? Greetings. My name is uh, Jake Goodman. I'm from uh, Rockville, um, and I uh, my my role with ACT is that I just like when I heard, you know, I've always knew that ACT existed. I remember around like the you know election seasons whether it was 2018 2020 and 22 seeing y'all firing you know around the metro stations so i knew what each you know where each politician running for office stood on transit but you know i you know once i've learned more about like all the transit discrepancies and what we really need and you know i've realized that there's a lot of stuff we, we still need to fix in this county and in this state you know i really wanted to get more involved because I feel like, you know, there's definitely a lot of room to for improvement within the state and within the county in transit. I was passing around just quickly, you know, your name and where you're from. <laughs> I'm, I'm Helen Heinrich. I'm from Wheaton and I'm loud on Twitter. Uh, ben Ross uh, uh, used to be president of this organization years ago, and I'm now chair of the Maryland Transit Opportunities Coalition from Bethesda. Chris Farrell, I live in uh, the Kent Mill section of Wheaton. I'm currently on the board and uh, will be on the slate for vice president. Dino Drudy, Old Town, Alexandria. Uh, Nick Brand. Uh, former president, uh, outgoing uh, treasurer, and uh, living in Chevy Chase. I'm Patrick DeCorla Souza. I uh, live in Alexandria, and I'm here because I invented Hotter Lanes, which Michael is gonna talk about. I'm Michael Larkin. I'm a resident of Silver Spring. I'm also on the steering committee for Montgomery for All. Ed Barron, Silver Spring. Peter Katz, Kensington. Uh, years ago, I wrote a book called New Urbanism, ran an organization about new urbanism, and now have a nonprofit called SmartGo that is involved with transportation and place. Uh, Fred Doc, Washington, D.C. Michael Replogle. Um, I now live uh, just outside of Annapolis um, and uh, lived in Montgomery County for 30 odd years uh, in Silver Spring and uh, uh, Chevy Chase West, and uh, then spent six years as Deputy Commissioner of New York City Department of Transportation. Been a member of ACT uh, going back. Uh, decades to its early days. Hand it back to Lev real quick. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Lev Boone and I am your friendly neighborhood action committee for transit organizer. Pleasure to have you all here this evening. Thank you for braving the weather to come on out. All right, well, um, I am not ACT's president, Amy Freeler. Unfortunately, Amy uh, is not here tonight because uh, she uh, had some exposures to COVID over the weekend and is not feeling well. So um, I'm afraid she decided it was Good idea to not be here. I, I'm Sean Robertson. I'm from Kensington, um, and uh, I'm one of the uh, vice presidents on the board as well. So, um, with that, I don't see anybody else racing in the door. So, um, you know, this is normally when we do our election. Um, anybody who is membership is active uh, by December 30th should have received an index card checking in. Um, so, I know we're right on the edge. In the eye of uh, the chair, uh, yeah, I believe we have a quorum. Does anybody want to object? All right. If there's no objection, um, we'll take a moment to um, conduct our annual election of officers. Um, so we have uh, 
something that's actually really exciting and that we've got a contested office. Um, uh, and then we also have the slate of uncontested offices. Um, we'll handle the uncontested offices first. Um, so um, President Amy Friedler is running for re-election. Treasurer Eric Heron is uh, running uh, for, uh, er, Eric Heron's running for treasurer. Um, and then for vice presidents, uh, Miriam Schoenbaum, uh, Chris Farrell, and myself. Um, and board members, Shanika Whitehurst and Helen Heinrich. Um, and so, um, so we'll address those offices first. So if, um, uh, if you were a member in good standing, you should have received one of these index cards. And so if you'd like to vote for the slate as nominated, please uh, raise your card. All right. In the opinion of the chair, uh, uh, that slate is elected. Um, I think we already, uh, um, so for this Office of Secretary, uh, we have a contested election. So exciting to hear uh, interest in um, the board. Jake uh, was nominated from the floor in the December meeting. Um, do you want to say anything else in addition to what you said in the very beginning? No, I'm happy to ask questions. Oh, all right. Greetings, esteemed colleagues and members of the ACE of the Action Committee for Transit. I know my name, well, first off, my name is Jacob M. Goodman or Jake. Just please call me Jake. Um, and um, I know I am fairly new to this organization and have only really been in present at um, five different me meetings, three of which were virtual um, because of some time constraints and stuff. But um, I'm making it a point to come to the more in-person meetings like I was here last time. And, you know, I'm here now. Um, there, you know, with, with looking at transit as a whole, which is something we are all very, very focused on, you know, we in general, you know, need to realize that there's a lot of discretion. governments, state government, and the federal government. Washington's literally just over that, that line. Rockville, just 10 minutes that way. I'm probably not thinking the most accurate direction, but it, you, you get what I'm saying. And Annapolis, three minutes that way. Now that of those three is probably the least accessible to get to, but we can organize carpools, we can organize van pools, and make it a point to advocate even more for better transit to connect Annapolis to the rest of the state as well. I see very high potential and growth for this organization in the next year or two, or even in the next five or 10 years. And there's a lot of ways we can make it, make the mission of this organization more robust because you know, the purple line was only the beginning, let's face it. There's room for more bus rapid transit lines and, you know, expanding the metro. We still need to get the metro fully expanded to its original, get the red line to its original plan. They wanted it to go to Germantown at one point. Why isn't it doing that? We want the Mark train to run 24-7 or at least 
have the Brunswick and Camden lines run at the same amount of time as the Penn line. In fact, we should try to advocate on the Virginia side to make it so that they can add, you know, make the VRE run the same amount as the Penn line. DC might act, you know, act like a Sun Belt city sometimes in terms of transit. DC might act like a Sun Belt city sometimes in terms of transit. But as culturally northeastern we are, despite being South Canadian and Dixon Line, we need to start acting like the rest of the Northeast Corridor in terms of transit. We need to have the commuter rail run around the same time as Philadelphia and Boston, if not yellow, as 24-7 as the LIRR. There is a lot of need to set an example for the rest of the country. We need to really show that this state can actually be the most progressive in terms of transit south of Mason East. We need to show to people who cannot drive, not just the people who are eco-conscious like us who might not want to drive, but the people who cannot drive, like you know, myself and there are other people out there who, due to various disabilities, cannot drive, that this, that we welcome you in this county, in this state, in this country. We can forge new alliances with other transit advocacy organizations across the country. We can also, you know, hold you know various panel discussions. Like an idea I, I think we should have is like you know, so there are a lot of transit YouTubers out there. So maybe we have like a little transit YouTuber conference here, you know, and stuff like that. And also have you know regional transit agencies have a panel up here of directors. Um, there's a lot that we can accomplish. We we are already great, and we can be even greater. Thank you. And I hope I can have your vote for sec the highly esteemed position of secretary. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, I'd like to. Uh, speak on behalf of the nominating committee. Sean Emerson uh, was very much planning to come here, but the weather has uh, gotten in his way. He's a Gaithersburg resident. Uh, and <clears throat> we have, uh, but I'd like to explain why we nominated Sean. Uh, let me say, first of all, on the nominating committee, this is, this new board will, uh, mark a tremendous change in act. Uh, built a purple line, uh, and that was our main focus, the dominant focus for the first 30 years. And this board that is, uh, will come in no matter who wants, wins this election, uh, will be composed entirely of people who live outside the Beltway. Which is, you know, a tremendous change for us. Uh, so now let me explain why we nominated Sean Emerson for secretary. Uh, Sean is one of the great young transit leaders in Montgomery County. Uh, he first got involved in ACT when he was a student at UMD. Uh, he, be <clears throat> he became an aide to uh, Mark Foreman in the legislature, uh, then became a council aide. He now works for the county. He now works for the uh, Parks Department non-political job, but he's able to take, uh, take on this position. Uh, what he, he has agreed to do, in addition to the duties of secretary, the you know, limited duties of secretary of state, uh, 
is that he will be the program chair arranging speakers with uh, Sumil Dasgupta has been doing for the last couple of years. And he is, you know, because of his experience in county council staff and legislative staff and now in the county government, he has the contacts to get us speakers and know who they are. Uh, but there's much more to what Sean has done. Uh, when he was still a student, I believe, he came back, he came up with a fix for the, and I'm going to say what he won't say, failed BRT line on US 29, which uh, the basic problem with it is, well, there's several basic problems, but one of the basic problems is that it doesn't really have any of its own uh, dedicated lanes. And he came up with a design to put it, and where they sort of, they have sort of kind of dedicated lane that they don't actually use, it's where the traffic doesn't back up. And that's, and Sean came up with a plan to create a dedicated lane on the, uh, in the section of the worst bottleneck, you know, just north of the beltway around four corners. And this plan was so good that we managed to, uh, after much work, the county council uh, got the, uh, I mean, it's, it, we convinced the county council to tell the Department of Transportation they have to seriously look at it, uh, which instead of implementing it when they first started the BRT, they said, well, we'll do a study and get this thing started. And of course, it's been dragging their feet since. But it showed his deep, deep understanding of transit. And all of the professionals have validated that this is a very good plan and practical plan to have a center running BRT lane in the most, con in the spot where that US 29 is most congested from the Beltway north to White Oak. Um, he really has a great understanding of the issues. Uh, he has served in the past as an officer of that, as a board member, and he has, you know, agreed to come back. And we believe he will be a tremendous asset to our organization. And I urge you to vote for him. All right. Thank you, Ben, and thank you to uh, you, Jake, for your leadership. And I'd say, you know, regardless of who wins this particular office, this is an organization hungry for leaders and volunteers, and it's exciting to have some competition. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, we'll find space for whoever is interested in a leadership role here. Um, but with no further ado, I figure we should go ahead and have an election. So um, if um, folks are interested in Voting for Sean Emerson, uh, please raise your card. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, if you're interested in voting for Jake Goodman, please raise your card. One, two, what's that? Oh, that's fine. Um, two, all right. So, my opinion, yeah, it is Sean Emerson, but there will be opportunities, Jake. I'm so excited that you're interested. And uh, with that, I did want to hand Mike back to uh, Ben. Want to talk a little bit about our? Um, um, oops. Want to talk about our leaflet? Hey. Hi. Uh, well, I think everyone has read about the metro, the uh, state transportation budget. And uh, as it explained in the article in the uh, last Transit Times, it's actually even worse than it sounds like for transit. The,
Senate gives the option. So far. So what we are planning to do is a letter writing campaign to the state senators. Uh, and we are in the midst of setting this up. Uh, we have a new software tool which will be able to uh, hit a QR code and go to a page where you type in your address and it will tell you who your state senator is and then give you a form to send them an email. Uh, and right now we are, of course, working through the software difficulties. <laughs> um, but the plan is that we will have email appeals, <coughs> and more importantly, we are going to leaflet at the metro station in the morning. And we will need lots of volunteers giant effort, but we have lots of experience that it generates big results. Uh, you know, I can't the purple, I will say the great advantage we have politically is that if you stand in front of the metro station and pass out leaflets, you are laser targeting the transit supporters. Um, so, uh, you know, we have experience with this have generated hundreds of emails to the county council repeatedly on the purple line. And frankly, without that, I think there's an excellent chance we would not have a purple line. But we need lots of volunteers, and we need to get up in the morning early. Uh, how early depends on the station. Uh, so... Uh, everyone here that can, we plan to start, do it the weeks of uh, Tuesday through Thursday, the weeks, uh, not next week, but the week after next and the week after that, and the uh, which station, which day will be worked out depending on the, you know, availability of the volunteers. And so if you are able to help, please talk to Lev tonight uh, and let him know which stations you prefer and which uh, and then we'll get back you know we'll get back to a sort of negotiation of which day we do each station and what hours you can do we fit you in uh, you know depending on the station. Are we only the plan in the past we focused on the morning because uh, what works well is you give them the leaflets, they get on the train, they got nothing to do except read your leaflets. Uh, exceptions. Medical, there's a few stops where you, you do want to do you know, like acne and tetanus. Um, all right. And additionally, uh, having this weekend uh, a stuffing party for our first dude notices of 2024. Uh, if you're interested in helping out, oh, oh please also oh, oh, uh, reach out to me, and uh, we're meeting Sunday at around 1.30. Only should take a couple of hours, or, or, uh, will be given to people who actually want to come. Uh, it's a big help, and it's always a nice little bonding exercise, if nothing else. So, uh, thank you so much, and with that, I'll turn it back over to you, and uh, I'll just try to get that working, or I'll just talk loudly. Um, I must say, I'm so excited to introduce uh, Michael Replogel. Um, you know, you already introduced yourself a little bit, your history with Montgomery County, but I'll tell you, there's one heck of a professional resume here as well. Um, you know, certainly 
I want to thank you for coming and speaking with us tonight. Uh, Michael Replogo uh, founded the Institute Policy. for Transportation um, Development Policy. Serving a number of uh, roles there. A number of uh, roles organized the bikes, there. not bombs uh, organized campaign. Organized the bikes, uh, sending 10,000 bikes campaign. to Nicaraguan um, teachers and health workers. Health workers. Um, um, and um, you know, the organization became a catalytic uh, player, player advancing BRT, bike sharing, traffic safety, the transport development, development, other, other uh, reforms worldwide. And of course, you had the opportunity to, to see that into action, into action. Uh, helping to take the same bike system in New York to over 40,000 shared bicycles. bicycles. Um, you know, certainly, certainly a, 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 also a founder, founder, founder of, uh, uh, co-founder uh, of the Partnership on Sustainable, sustainable Low Carbon Transport. Um, fostering a uh, $175 billion 10-year commitment for uh, more sustainable transport for multilateral bank banks. Bank. I mean, um, you know, of course, the number of accolades in the city of New York, uh, cutting transportation or cutting traffic and pedestrian deaths um, by 40%. Um, design of New York's open restaurant program in a matter of weeks uh, that turned 10,000 parking spaces into outdoor cafes. Um, also worked as transportation director for Environmental Defense Fund, and um, of course um, oversaw um, comprehensive planning, travel forecasting, and mobile growth management for Montgomery County, um, and serves on an EPA committee. I mean, that goes on and on. But I do want to thank you so much for coming and speaking to us tonight. So, thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here this evening um, for all of you who come out in this uh, rainy night. Um, you know, I think we face a, a raft of, of transportation challenges and budget issues. And, um, you know, it's, I've, I've been working on a number of things. And this, this slide presentation tonight um, gets into some a synthesis and distillation of a number of things that, that I've worked on and things that are emerging as opportunities here and I think in other parts of the country. I think we're wrestling with so many challenges to finance transportation, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, uh, to increase equity of access in transportation, and nothing short of a transformation of how we manage our road system will suffice uh, in coming years. So I want to talk tonight about what Peter Katz has helped uh, label as IC4M, as, an, as a catchy acronym, uh, Integrated Congestion and Multimodal Mobility Management. And let me talk about that and talk about how hotter lane concepts uh, fit into that as their key infrastructure element. It's good to be back here tonight. Um, I you know, have spent a lot of time in Maryland uh, resident for more than 30 years. Um, happy to be living back now out in Annapolis and still get into this area. My daughter and two grandchildren live in Potomac um, and uh, I have a couple sons south of DC uh, in Northern Virginia. And uh, my girlfriend lives in DC. So I'm back here uh, quite a lot and traveling on our roads. Um, so I spent a lot of time in this region. I saw how I-270 got widened from six to 12 lanes when I was at the Park and Planning Commission. It distressed me then. I was a member of Sierra Club and worked behind the scenes to try and help them uh, resist that uh, road widening, which was an inevitability uh, back in the 1980s. Um, I'm happy to have been able to play a role in some of New York's transformation under Bill de Blasio, which built on good efforts from Mayor Bloomberg. Um, and But it's bittersweet to come back here now because we see so much traffic, so much congestion, and so many people clamoring to fix it with old fixes. The reality is we have what we have today in no small part because of induced demand. We've built a lot of roads and people have filled them with motor vehicles. And for every new mile of road that we build, we get thousands of new miles, vehicle miles of travel, guaranteed. It's like building coal-fired power plants. You're guaranteed to get emissions. You build roads, you're guaranteed to get more VMT, even if you're managing the lane. If you expand capacity further, more will come. I saw through, as a, when I was working for the Environmental Defense Fund, 
uh, managed a, a group of uh, organizations that looked at alternatives to building the inner county connector uh, through Montgomery County Stream Valley Parks. This was built uh, despite substantial evidence that better management of existing highways would be more effective. We looked in 2005 at how adding and converting toll lanes on the existing expressways, I-270, I-495, and I-95, and using revenues to fund new uh, toll finance bus rapid transit services would really provide a much more effective solution to all of the purported reasons the inter-county connector was to be built. The design we looked at was a transit supportive toll lane design with median stations so that people could exchange from rapid buses operating in reserve rights of way on the motorway with arterial bus services um, getting them to local destinations. We found that converting the existing capacity to hot lanes with better transit and transit oriented development did more than the intercounty connector to cut congestion, save money, boost transit and equity, and cut greenhouse emissions and DMT. And by no small amount, I mean, the difference was like 20% difference in transportation greenhouse emissions um, if you, in between building the intercounty connector versus better managing the existing capacity and doing transit oriented development uh, looking some years out. The ICC meant more time driving and the alternatives cut vehicle hours spent in traffic. And the alternatives we examined were cheaper than building the intercounty connector. In fact, the intercounty connector was financed by doubling the tolls on every toll facility across Maryland because the facility itself couldn't pay for itself out of tolls because the demand for it wasn't there, it wasn't warranted except to justify suburban sprawl at places like Conterra. So we today see claims that managed lanes are more sustainable than simply building road capacity. And indeed, there's probably a benefit to putting in a managed lane compared to general purpose road capacity. But is sustainability really the goal, or is it just a cover for adding more roads? So Maryland's been considering uh, managed lanes for some years. Uh, this shows an earlier proposals for Maryland managed lanes all the way up into Frederick County, all the way around the Beltway. Um, Maryland DOT, after going through a draft environmental impact study that looked at most of the Beltway in Maryland and out I-270, has curtailed the proposal in their final environmental impact study uh, to a a smaller scope that ends at the uh, I-270 spurs and goes down to the American Legion bridges and leaves unaddressed the eastern part of Maryland's Capital Beltway. But it's worth examining what the experience has been with these managed lanes in Northern Virginia, where a quite extensive network has already been built. The president of Transurban for North America uh, has been quoted a couple of years ago saying the worst thing about express lanes is when they end. And indeed, what we've seen and what he was referring to is that at the terminus point, oh, she, uh, at the terminus point of these high occupancy toll lanes, uh, you end up with congestion points. And this shows you here in a, in a photo from Northern Virginia, one such congestion point uh, at the end of the hot lane network. And we also see the proposed variable price lane network for Washington, D.C. that's been under consideration by the Council of Governments for some years. This goes back to a map from 2005. And you can see it's a quite extensive network across Maryland as well as Northern Virginia. Uh, and with these being proposed as additional lanes, not converting and managing existing capacity. So let's talk for a moment about the taxonomy of managed lanes. HOV lanes, pretty obvious, I think, to everyone here in the room. You have two, three, or four people in the vehicle, you get to use them. 
And increasingly, HOV lanes have been converted into high occupancy toll lanes, um, recognizing that often HOV lanes have had excess capacity or unused capacity, I should say, uh, in those lanes. And that by offering that capacity to toll paying drivers on a, often with a dynamic toll, you could still allow free flowing traffic in those lanes uh, for HOVs and also generate some toll revenue that could be used to pay for better transit and potentially to pull some traffic off the general purpose lanes. So the, I'll take questions after the talk, please. So do, DO, do HOT lanes actually help the environment? Well, FHWA says they might, and, and in fact, you know, in many cases they might, but I think more often than not, uh, the, the uh, fundamental law of traffic congestion and, and induced traffic shows that adding road capacity simply adds more traffic. So Pat DeCorla Sue's at the federal, who works at the Federal Highway Administration has come up with this concept of high occupancy uh, toll lanes, uh, hotter lanes, high occupancy transit and tolls on existing lanes with rewards or hotter lanes. Um, and written several very good papers about this and, and done some analysis of how this could operate on the Capitol Beltway in the sections that Maryland DOT dropped from consideration in their final environmental impact study. So hotter lanes can look identical to hot lanes, but the key is what you don't see that makes them different. Now I wanna talk about this term hotter and, and mention Patrick who's in the back of the room and who, who may be available to take some questions and comments at some point in this evening. But he has done much of this, generally he'd done his work in his private capacity as a citizen, not as a, an advocate uh, coming from the federal government. So I wanna just let you take in this image that Patrick is here tonight, not representing Federal Highway Administration, but uh, as, as someone who, who does have some considerable expertise in this area. And I appreciate uh, his research contributions and. I've incorporated those into my talk here tonight. So hotter lanes look like hot lanes, but they boost the capacity and efficiency of existing lanes with congestion pricing and by paying travelers who share rides. So this is an important linkage. It's not just letting people buy their way into reserved lanes like a hot lane, but it's actually, as you see in this slide, taking existing lanes and uh, allowing preferential use uh, for those who pay a toll in those lanes and then using toll revenue to help pay people incentives to get into carpools or to take transit. So hotter lanes provide the physical context for what we're talking about here. It's the burner and the pot. And integrated congestion, multimodal management is what we're cooking in the pot, the IC4M with things like transit supportive toll lane design um, as opposed to just managed lanes. And as part of IC4M, hotter lanes also involve real-time operation management, monitoring for performance, ramp metering, road user charges that manage the congestion on some or all of the lanes, and fund transit and driver and rider incentives. It also includes incorporating bus rapid transit and express buses and travel demand management that evolves to include pay per mile car insurance and mobility as a service. So real time traffic operations and management monitoring and performance and ramp metering are all things that state highway administration has a pretty good knowledge of how to do and I think they could be asked to do more of it to do it more effectively and to do it within the framework of this larger toolbox of integrated uh, congestion management. Road user charges to manage congestion are being used in many cities around the world, and they're being used to manage existing road capacity in places like Stockholm and soon in New York City, where 
I and my staff worked a lot on helping to bring congestion pricing to the city. And it's been a long and painful process, but indeed I think it's gonna get over the finish line in the next year. And will involve pricing and managing existing roads coming into the city. Now, some may say trying to price and manage existing lanes is political impossibility. Well, they said the same thing in many other places, in London, in Sweden, in Norway. But indeed, for example, in Stockholm, before they implemented congestion charges for the central city area of Stockholm, including in ex expressways cutting across the city center, public opinion was overwhelming by a two to one margin against the congestion charge. But after six months, the majority approved of it at the ballot box when it was put up to a non-binding referendum. And by nine months after the implementation, two to one people approved the congestion charge. In fact, conservative parties that had opposed it up front came to support it because it provided so much revenue. It filled a revenue gap, which enabled them to program funding for a variety of multimodal transportation improvements, both road and public transport. So let's look for a moment at the science of corridor management and, and congestion pricing. We see here a classic volume delay function curve. And we see in the upper left-hand corner of that curve, typical condition early in the morning before rush hour has gotten going or late at night, people are moving at 60 miles an hour greater. And, and then as the rush hour in the morning develops, more and more traffic builds until you get close to the practical capacity of, the, of a motorway, which is typically around uh, 1,800 or 2,000 vehicles per hour per lane. And once you reach that, reach that saturation point, it's a matter of traffic engineering science. It's like particle physics, that you go from laminar flow to turbulent flow. And as that phase transition happens, the speed falls because the friction grows. And then as the speed falls, the throughput that gets past a particular point also falls. So you lose road capacity at the very time when the most people want to use the road capacity and you get great inefficiency in the system. So you go from a state uh, in the upper picture to the state in the lower picture of stop and go bottleneck congestion when the facility is not carrying traffic effectively. And it takes you a while to crawl out of that hole once a bottleneck is formed. Now there's Doug McDonald, who uh, one of my colleagues with Washington State DOT, some years ago did a uh, very clever uh, challenge trying to help, how do you explain this phenomena of traffic physics uh, effectively? And you can do it with rice and a uh, funnel. So if you start pouring the same amount of rice through two glass funnels identical to each other. The first one starting from a free flow state, the second one from a back up state, then look at these as the equivalent of congestion. As you pour through the free flow state, it drops down into the bin. And so the bin that has been moving at free flow conditions gets full while the other one that started at a congested state has had its capacity constrained by that particle physics that is the speed curve that I showed you earlier. We see this again in a bar graph. This comes from State Road 91 in Southern California where a couple of toll managed lanes carry more cars at higher speed than four managed lanes that are parallel to them at the same time, which are moving at a much decayed speed. Um, and the reality is that managed lanes are priced to remain efficiently free flowing during times of peak demand to keep you in that upper part of that, uh, that U-shaped boomerang curve. In contrast, the general purpose lanes can lose half or more of their throughput capacity during congested times. Now, if only some lanes, whether they're new or existing, are priced 
and managed. Tolls need to be higher. There's less preservation of that peak period road capacity. And merges to and from the managed lanes have to be engineered, which limits the number of access points. Now we can see the cost of mixing managed and unmanaged lanes here in some of these photos. On the, the, uh, the, the left-hand side, you can see that large costly flyover ramps and slip ramps can sometimes take up a lot of space and a lot of money. Um, and only longer trips can be accommodated in the managed lanes because you can't put these access ramps just everywhere. They have to be spaced miles apart. On the right hand side, you see a simpler pylon treatment, or sometimes even in the image in the center below, uh, you see uh, unseparated managed versus unmanaged lanes. And these can work okay, but potentially sometimes pose traffic safety problems as you get fast traffic in the express lane and slower traffic and people darting from the slow lane into the fast lane or coming from the fast lane and trying to merge into the slow lanes. So difficult traffic engineering headaches. But if all of the existing lanes are priced and managed, which is full facility congestion pricing, the tolls can be set lower while fully protecting the peak road capacity for everyone and giving everyone that 45 mile an hour or higher travel experience on the limited access motorway. And the infrastructure costs can be much lower. And this is in fact what is done in Stockholm and Singapore and many other places that have priced full facilities. So integrated congestion management also builds in incentives for pooling and toll charging through apps. And the technology exists, and right now we have the uh, Easy Pass Flex, which is used a lot in Northern Virginia for carpools to get a special rate or a free rate to use managed lanes, but that's a little cumbersome. Um, you can also do this through apps where you have multiple cell phones in a car to prove occupancy and ways of auditing. And the technology exists now from a company here in the region, CAPS, um, to do this kind of rideshare incentive matching and, and building on experience with the Washcog uh, uh, car ride uh, trip uh, ride sharing app and, and other things from Hitch and, and other companies like that. There also is a lot of potential to link integrated congestion management with next generation app based mobility services. Things like pay by the mile uh, car insurance, which gives people a way to save money if you drive fewer miles. And Brook, research by Brookings Institute has shown that you can reduce vehicle miles traveled by 10%. Also build it into cash incentive systems that give people feedback, whether it's just information or whether it's actual money in their bank account or their mobility management account. Um, and lots of ways of doing user side subsidies like Los Angeles is starting to do and Seattle is testing with mobility wallets. Um, hot lanes require tolling all day. The service is quite only if you're a HOV3, whereas in hotter lanes, you can have tolling only in the peak period. The service for transit can be funded in a guaranteed way. We have rewards for people who form HOV3 carpools. So this is a way that even in a fiscally constrained environment, like we are here today in Maryland, where transit cuts are threatening in this way, we can move forward to better management. 
So let's consider our current situation in, the, in our part of the D.C. region. So MDOT's proposed to spend billions of dollars to add two new hotlines section on I-270 in the capital beltway uh, in the area that's shown here on this uh, map. And so there's a hotter lane alternative that Patrick Coral Souza has evaluated in some recent papers, which would convert the existing HOV lane on I-270 to a hotter lane and, and turn one of the general purpose lanes into a hotter lane. And on the Capitol Beltway, convert two existing general purpose lanes into hotter lanes. So that would also come with the bus rapid transit network operating on these motor ways and connecting to Virginia with mobility hubs and activity centers the first last mile connectivity services, micro mobility, transit, and park and ride opportunities, with a casual carpooling app with designated pick up and drop off locations and area places where you can do slug lines, essentially. And cash rewards for carpoolers and transit riders funded from surplus toll revenue. So, What would it take to shift a certain number of drivers and passengers into carpools um, and to get certain results and to free up enough capacity on the facility to relieve congestion and keep the traffic moving slowly? What could you do with those revenues? So using research from uh, California um, and looking at these passenger reward curves, how much would it take uh, to shift X number of percentage of drivers or passengers uh, into carpools? Uh, this model is calculated that estimated shift to transit in HOV3, on I-270, and I-495, and evaluated the resulting travel speeds in the existing lanes in the hotter configuration, and in fact found something similar to what we showed you for the SR91, that the hotter lanes would carry, uh, instead of in the existing framework, all the lanes are assumed to carry 2,100 vehicles per hour per lane at about 41 miles an hour in the peak hour. In the hotter lane configuration, the hotter lanes would carry around 1,600 vehicles per hour per lane at about 55 miles an hour. And the free lanes would benefit from reduction in congestion caused by that shift of some motorists into carpools and, and uh, transit, so that the free lanes would still be carrying about 2,000 vehicles per hour per lane at about 44 miles an hour, so slightly better off than existing formation. And that produces some substantial operating revenue, which can be used to fund those incentives to better transit. So, Going from that, uh, some ideas for how we can take that into some practical next steps here in Virginia. And I think these are things that I would uh, personally uh, hope that ACT and its allies might advocate for in the coming weeks and months as this will be debated uh, as Maryland is dealing with all of its transit cuts. And budget issues and that transportation. So phase one could be to convert one general purpose lane to HOV on the American Legion Bridge in each direction only during peak periods and introduce express bus services and casual carpooling apps to the corridor, providing cash rewards using a federal discretionary grant, which FHWA is giving out a lot of grant money right now. It's one of the things they do have on bipartisan infrastructure law. And then in phase two, Maryland could convert those HOV lanes to hotter lanes, introducing variable tolls for non-HOVs only during peak periods, and providing cash rewards using surplus revenue from toll revenue. So that's an opportunity for the American Legion Bridge. And, and even if Maryland does go forward with the American Legion Bridge program, 
this this hotter lane approach could be done with current capacity expanded capacity. It would make more sense from a cost effectiveness standpoint to do it with the current capacity to show what can be done before you spend billions of dollars simply widening the road uh, in its normal traffic. Um, and this could be done uh, with the existing highway capacity. So another opportunity on the southern Beltway crossing uh, from Alexandria over to um, uh, Maryland, where Virginia DOT is proposing an expansion of the south side capital Beltway to complete its managed lane network, again, at the cost of billions of dollars. And WMATA is already proposing that they would extend the yellow line across uh, to National Harbor from Alexandria, across the same bridge crossing. So VDOT proposes to use the space reserved for Metro. When WMATA is ready to extend the yellow line, VDOT currently proposes to dismantle its managed lane and to convert the adjacent general purpose lane to a managed lane to accommodate the yellow line. But what, if, what about if instead there's a pilot on the I-495 Woodward Road where the existing future management would be done with two managed directions and no highway expansion would be needed. So I want to stop with, the, with those two ideas tools and framework they're built upon, and then just call your attention to several papers that Patrick Boyle Susan has published, which I think deserve closer study, and which I think Maryland DOT ought to look at in more detail uh, as they consider how to move forward with this corridor. And also, uh, I'd like to lay you with a couple of other papers that I've written that are available online about bus rapid transit, about uh, full managed lanes, and high performance corridors. These are things I wrote, uh, that's hard to 20 years ago almost. <laughs> and, and maybe now is the time. And I want to acknowledge uh, Peter Katz for his contribution to help put this conference. Thank you very much. known that congestion pricing works, and we've seen it work in a lot of other cities. Um, it's always a political hurdle. Uh, the, the biggest challenge is, is our leadership. Um, you need a leader who's willing to you know, basically say, this is something that we need to seriously evaluate and, and, and then move forward and test it. And in where we've seen this, for example, in London, we saw it tested uh, by uh, uh, 
Ken Livingston, who says, I'm going to do some Jesuit pricing and do some, you know, help make, make London work better. And he did it. And then Morris Johnson built on it and expanded it. Um, in, in New York, um, we saw Mayor Bloomberg almost get congestion pricing through um, uh, some years ago, back in 2007, 2008. I worked on that when I was living in Carmel on the fence fund. And it was stopped. We had the support of the Bush administration. We had the support of the governor. We had the support of the city council. We had the support of the state legislature, except we didn't have the support from uh, Sheldon Silver, who was the state senator from Lower Manhattan, very corrupt guy, went to jail uh, actually for a number of years for corruption. And uh, you know, I think Mayor Bloomberg didn't kiss Sheldon Silver's ring. Um, and, and Sheldon refused to bring congestion pricing to a vote in the Senate and killed it for 10 years, 15 years. Um, it made a resurrection um, then actually when we got the support of uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo, who the idea back to life. And he, you know, the, gov mayor, the governor of New York, has control over the MTA. He was able to push through a uh, congestion pricing plan in the state legislature um, as a way of trying to deal with the huge transportation financing problem. The MTA capital program needed renewing, and it had a 30 or $50 billion budget gap, and congestion pricing was designed and indeed passed by the legislature explicitly to close $15 billion of the budget gap in the, uh, the MTA capital program. And so the congestion pricing legislation that passed about five years ago now um, explicitly says design a congestion pricing program that will raise sufficient revenue around a billion and a half dollars a year that it can be used to bond, provide bond coverage for about $15 billion of the MTA capital program. And then everything flowed from that that was driven by the capital funding program budget gap closure exercise. We could, if there were some political leadership here in Maryland, with the new governor, we have a potential to may not be an issue he wants to bring, but it is an issue that he, that some political allies could bring to him and say, you've got a big budget gap. This is one way of trying to close the gap uh, here in Maryland and, and to better manage the existing system so everybody benefits and not to have to wait five or ten years for new capacity to come online at great cost in another effort to solve congestion in a way that we know because we've seen it time and time and time again. You know, we just push the can down the road when we fly. So it's, it's a leadership thing, and you have to build broad coalitions. You have to build a media campaign. You need a lot of different players on board. Uh, New York equity has been a key issue to address. And so, you know, the legislation is designed, you know, to say, okay, you know, there has to be some discount for low-income people living in Manhattan. In fact, the way the, the legislation was set up to require a traffic review board to be appointed by the governor and the mayor to really deal with a lot of the hard questions of like what should the tolls be and who should get discounts and exemptions. You know, every cop in New York wants an exemption so they can drive into the city because the cops all drive cars. <laughs> right. Yeah. So the, the, this traffic review board, in fact, came out with a report. It's up for public comment today. It's uh, I guess the comments close in, in a few weeks um, uh, to move to the final design for that. And it would offer toll discounts after the tenth trip for low-income people who you know get subject to the tolls. It would offer toll discounts for people with disabilities, but again, with a pretty stringent set of constraints, because the more people you exempt from congestion charges, the more higher the tolls have to be and the harder it is to administer and enforce. So you really want a system that has little leakage to it and that's designed with as many user built-in sort of user-side subsidies that are 
very targeted. Uh, but with that, you can make the politics work, and, uh, and that's happened recently. So, um, yeah, difficult challenge, but solvable. Yes, you had a question. How do you ensure accountability for the congestion pricing funds from congestion pricing and the funds from the bullies? Because when we see the big question that's also brought up when we're talking about tolls and you know building anything with like high occupancy tolling is where is the money from that actually going to depending on how the government is structured because as you know you know down here there are a lot of you know governments that would probably not be as transit friendly as you think and here maybe it's you know dc more so maryland more so but virginia you know it's okay you got to think of what portion of that funding is actually going to improve the transit system and how can we make it an accountability structure so there are like basically accountability watchdogs mm -hmm. in, within the government or an office in like whatever the government's ethics office or, not, or an ombudsman's office within the transportation or the highway administration to ensure that the money is actually going to help improve the public transportation infrastructure and not just the upkeep of the road. Yeah, we, we need uh, good transparency and that's not always been there in some of these managed land systems in, in northern Virginia and elsewhere. I think what we've seen in northern Virginia is you know, very expensive capital investment programs in many cases. I mean, six, I-66 was converting uh, existing HOV lanes to hot lanes that were managed and they had more revenue but with the uh, I-95 managed lanes, where there have been a lot of lane additions, spending a lot of money building the road capacity, and then that leaves you relatively little to invest in transit. And, but there is some, and uh, to its credit, I mean, Virginia has negotiated contracts with Transurban that say you've got to spend X number of dollars a year providing good express bus services in this quarter, and then there's some good benefit agreements. So there are ways of doing it there. In New York, it's essentially a lockbox that says the money that's raised from the congestion charging is gathered into the MTA bridges and tunnels, which is the agency that, bought, that oversees the 62 gantries that have been built around the central business district. And so that money will come in, and just as the MTA bridges and tunnels administers a lot of their money and puts a lot of it back into transit, um, just as New Jersey Transit does, is, uh, is funded in part by trans Hudson toll revenue, you have defined agreements that are, that are uh, above board and transparent and audited by state controllers and people like that. So, uh, I guess just a quick follow-up to that is how can we, we create sort of that lockbox mentality for Maryland and D.C. Similar, you know, revenue source for Omada or MTA. That's, I think, that's again a question that needs to be solved at a fairly high political level as part of legislation. And you do it by setting up uh, legislative institutions that are set up. You know, you could set up a, a Maryland uh, managed lane uh, authority or toll authority, and and say that you know the revenues that come into this. X amount goes into paying for the cost and upkeep of the tolling infrastructure and, and the administrative infrastructure, uh, and X amount goes into providing uh, incentives for the ride sharing to meet certain performance targets for keeping the lanes free flowing, and X amount goes into transit. And with those agreements, you know, subject to periodic audit. I think there's a real benefit to using uh, well-structured public-private partnership agreements because often the private sector, I think, does a better job of transparency if you have uh, requirements for that in a performance contract. And if the road, the road operator has to meet certain performance standards that the lanes will be free-flowing 95% of the time above you know, 45 miles an hour, and if they if they aren't, then the operator gets penalized, and they have to guarantee that X amount of the revenues go to transit and to ride sharing, 
that X amount of the revenues go to low income uh, people who travel in the corridor and who decide to subsidize. So in the legislative structure, which you have to set up as part of those agreements. Uh, we have a, oh, uh, a year ahead. Okay. <clears throat> I live in Old Town, Alexandria, so I have followed very closely uh, Virginia's plot to uh, repurpose say where they're going to come up with the money to pay that private contract uh, or concession. So, you know, it, it really doesn't make any sense to build these managed lanes and then 10, 15 years later, you know, convert it into a rail Because you investing all that money into that into those managed lanes, and can you imagine after people have been using these managed lanes for uh, let's say 15, 20, whatever number of years, they're going to be willing to just give it up? So you know, uh, Michael is right. You know, there will be or I. There will be public outcry against taking away the lanes that they already have, right? Right. That's yeah. why. That's why I. So why not use existing? That's why I think it's inappropriate to allow them to use the, the lanes that were supposed to be for transit for anything else. That's the point. I to think that once they're turned into hot lanes, um, they will ever be given up for anything else. Well, I, I they think will put, in all likelihood, there will be quiet pressures against Metro expansion yeah. well, I mean, over the river. To, to, to tell you the honest truth, my, my opinion, this, the slides that I showed you about that project are ones that Pat developed. Um, they weren't mine. Uh, my opinion is that they should price and manage all of the lanes the river crossings and not do just a couple lanes, but price the full facility. And by doing that, they would reduce the pressures to expand the capacity. They would leave the space for Metro Rail. They would provide financing that could, in fact, be used to put out Metro Rail sooner, if anything, or to put better bus service out in the meantime. So, uh, so you're saying that all of the bridges across the river should be folded? Yes, I think they should all be toll bridges at a lower toll than you will pay with the managed lanes. Absolutely. And with toll revenues used to pay for people to be in carpools or in transit, uh, that, that actually should be more equitable. That segue is nicely into the question we got from some of our viewers at home. 
Uh, does federal law and federal regulation allow tolls on existing interstate lines? Because your home was under the impression that there is say, there are some rules that might stymie such uh, policies. Over the years, there have been a variety of different restrictions put on tolling existing capacity. But in the latest transportation law, there are a number of different ways in which road operators can toll existing lanes under existing law. I don't, do you want to add anything to that, Matt? Well, you know. Currently, uh, you can convert an existing general purpose lane into a hot lane in two steps. The first step is you convert the general purpose lane into an HOV lane. Mm -hmm. The second step is you convert the HOV lane into a hot lane. And is there a time frame on that? You have to have it as an HOV you know, lane? You can do that sim uh, simultaneously.
before they implemented that cordon around the stock. Yeah, but in, we have a case in Singapore um, which implemented congestion pricing for its downtown area in the 19, mid 1980s. And they did not have an extensive transit system in place. They had buses mm -hmm. that were inadequate, and they basically depended on people to get into carpool right. quickly. And people did. And it was, you know, they started with, with low tolls, too. It was like a 50 cent charge or something standard during the peak. And it was only in the peak hour. I think it started first with just an AM peak period charge for a two or three hour AM. And people adapted quickly into carpools to save money. And traffic dropped in the central business district by 50% after they instituted this central area congestion charge. And traffic today, well, 40 years later, is still at the level of about 50% of what it was in 1984. They, they, they really, they've used pricing and they've extended that system uh, to be, you know, across the hours of the day and they've gone to electronic road pricing in the late 90s. But with all of this, they have, uh, in fact, managed traffic quite successfully and with popular support. So I think we have time for one more question. In, 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 in yeah, think the quick question. Quick, it's quick. Do we have time for one quick question? Yeah, sure. So Make it very quick, please, buddy. Okay, so good evening, Michael. How are you? So I just want to talk to you about um, the, what's going on for congestion for I-270. It's because sometimes, uh, I remember um, four years ago, Larry Hogan was playing to um, Y-270, but however, there's a politician going on to, because a lot of people are concerned that they add the extra toll. This may cause um, the homes or schools or any places to be taken away. It's because uh, Hogan was concerned about uh, if there's um, um, happening about the traffic congestion on I-270, especially um, for I-95, I just because there were not enough toll lanes that was added on each of the highway, especially for Route 5355 and uh, including Beersville Road. It's because I remember I took the bus in nearby Beersville Road, including especially the one to Wheaton, which is called, I guess, is it 586? It's because this is some of the concerns is about what I see is because some, each of the road doesn't have enough code. So how does that work? Well, traffic has an amazing way of re-equilibrating itself. When you introduce a change into the system, if you reduce the capacity, a lot of the traffic just disappears. And when you change the price of using the road, a lot of people say, well, you know, I'm going to travel at a different time of day, or I'm going to share a ride, or I'm going to take transit, or I'm not going to make that trip. Um, and it's the iron law of traffic congestion. Traffic expands to fill the space allotted to it. If you reduce the amount of space, you also reduce the amount of traffic. And it takes really relatively little time for traffic to find the new equilibrium. And we need to create much more priority for buses and traffic on a lot of arterial roads. We need to create bus rapid transit, mm -hmm. true bus rapid That's transit right. here in Montgomery County. Yes. And much better than what we see on Route 29. We need BRT down Wisconsin Avenue and down Beers Mill Road. A yeah. lot of arterials. And the Comprehensive Road Policy Study, which I helped put together as an architect up back in 1989, had laid out a whole network of bus rapid transit on major corridors across the county, and we showed that we could double the population and employment of Montgomery County by 2020 without exceeding traffic congestion thresholds in the adequate public facility building. If we did transit-oriented development, if we priced parking, and if we gave people walking and bike running options and, uh, and effective transit systems. So I'll stop there. I know we're out of time. All right. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much.